Name anything that's important in society right now, and it's a coin toss, whether it's an illusion. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today is part two of my two-part series with Todd Rose. Todd is the co-founder and president of Populous, a nonprofit think tank that works to find solutions to redistribute opportunity so all people have the chance to live fulfilling lives in a thriving society. Prior to Populous, Todd was a faculty member at Harvard University where he founded the Laboratory for the Science of Individuality and he directed the Mind, Brain, and Education program. Todd is the best-selling author of Dark Horse and The End of Average, and his most recent book, which is the topic of this second part for the podcast, is called Collective Illusions. For this part of the interview, I talked to Todd Rose about this notion of collective illusions. You know, humans are a tribal species, prone to conformity, and in a lot of instances, we act according to what our in-group wants rather than what we want as individuals. Ironically, Todd's research shows that we make poor inferences about the majority consensus, and that failing to recognize collective illusions can have negative consequences on our identities, relationships, values, and society. To avoid falling into conformity traps, Todd encourages us to live congruent private and public lives that adhere to our personal convictions. Absolutely love this episode, love this chat with Todd, just as much as I like part one, which was about intelligence. I really like this notion of congruency, which is a topic that the humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers talked about a lot. And as you all know, I'm a humanistic psychologist, so this really tickled my humanistic psychology side. So without further ado, I bring you Todd Rose. Hey, Todd, I wanted to talk to you about your new book, Collective Illusions, as well. I know we had this amazing chat about intelligence, but I really want to cover this new idea. Why why do you decide to write this book? You know, look, it's interesting. Um, You know, at my think tank, Populous, we do a lot of what's called private opinion research, right? Getting around effects of social distortion, try to get at what people really think. Um, And, you know, I had known about this phenomenon which we call collective illusions, historically has been called things like pluralistic ignorance, um, the illusion of universality, things like this. And because we'd known about it, uh, we started asking people not only what they thought about certain issues, but what they thought most people thought, right? And what was so shocking, it was actually the first time we ever did it was in like 2015, and it was almost like a throwaway question. We weren't even sure what we'd get. And what we found over and over again since is that it almost doesn't matter what topic we ask about. If it's socially important, it's like a coin toss whether we're wrong about what the majority really believes. And so we're living in this time when these collective illusions may actually be one of the defining features of modern society. And as we can talk about, they, they have such like damaging consequences for the individual and the group. Um, and I felt like this could no longer just be an academic conversation. Like we need to have a conversation with the general public about this issue. So what is a collective illusion then? <laughs> right. So like, <laughs> what's the definition? <laughs> simply, yeah, simply stated, right. Collective illusions are situations where the majority in a group ends up going along with something that they don't privately agree with simply because they incorrectly think that most other people in the group agree with it. And, and as a result, entire groups can end up doing things that almost nobody really wanted. Yeah, you say, here's a quote from you, you say, when individuals conform to what they think the group wants, they can end up doing what nobody wants. That is the collective illusion's dark magic. I actually really like that quote. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's exactly. Uh, wow, there, there's some deeply ingrained things in our human psyche of tribalism that, that, that pull us in that direction, right? Like, what, what, can you explain the psychological mechanisms, why that draw is so powerful? Yeah, so look... It's funny because you'd imagine if you accept that this is pretty widespread and we, we can talk about all the evidence for that. The question is then why? Like, how, why are we so susceptible to being spectacularly wrong about the group and then end up like making something true that never was true? Mm. And it's really like mm. two underlying mechanisms, right? So the first is this conformity bias, which that's not very novel. Like, we know <laughs> we've known for a long time. That is a species, humans are, are a conforming species, right? Like, and so as I read about in the book, I mean, study after study shows like it's not just a choice. Like you, you are hardwired to all else equal, prefer to be with your group, not against it. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you can't overcome it, but we we definitely have that preference, right? Um, in in the in the book, I, I re- talked about one study, which is one of my favorite ones, where you know even something like who you think is good looking 
right? Which I, I kind of mm. love because I, I always yeah. like to think about like, how did people get funding for certain kinds of studies? Like, yeah. like scanning people's <laughs> brains and asking them, showing them pictures of people and ask him to rate them in terms of facial attractiveness felt like one that was you know, <laughs> hot or not, right? Like only it was yeah. okay because on a five point scale instead of a binary. But um, you know, in that one, it was like it, they manipulated, they showed people images, and you'd rate them like it was a one to five, and then they they would then say, "Oh, here's what the gr- the average of the group of people who have done this before, mm-hmm. how they rate the group." That's not even a group you would care. Why would you care, right? Mm-hmm. And yet, like systematically varying that so whenever your score individual score was consistent with the group you would get that sort of dopamine reward response in the brain they actually looked at the dopamine did they look at the dopamine flow not the flow unfortunately okay. like, they're not as smart as you scott but well, that'll be the follow-up but <laughs> what was also interesting is when you were told that your score deviated significantly from the group mm. um, it would trigger an, an error signal right which is this sort of reinforcement mm. learning mechanism that, hey, your behavior's wrong, and <laughs> change it. Um, so, like, this happens all the time. Now, great, okay, so we're a conforming species. That's, again, not, not new. Um, what I think is interesting is, and what's more relevant here, is for conformity to work, whether you like it or not, you have to know what the group actually thinks, right? Because mm-hmm. otherwise, what would you be conforming to? And this mm-hmm. is the rub. So, mm-hmm. like, as you know, the, the human brain is an energy hog, like, and you can learn a lot about a lot of our uh, biases and problems from the kinds of shortcuts that the brain takes uh, in the name of energy conservation. Well, it looks like estimating group consensus is one of those shortcuts, right? Because all it's equal, your brain tends to assume that the loudest voices repeated the most are the majority. And, and, and I think about that, I think, wow, it doesn't seem like a good, a good shortcut at all. But I guess if you go back and... Uh, through evolution and when most of our time was spent in like seeing like the Dunbar number kind of, you know, <laughs> groups, it probably, it obviously had to work well enough, right. To, to, uh, to be here with us. But now when you think about with social media and these massive imaginary communities, like nations and stuff, where you're never going to meet more than a tiny, tiny percentage of the people in your group, uh, that shortcut becomes problematic. Um, and we can talk about it. Like, I mean, social media in particular makes it very, very easy to distort perceived group consensus. Yeah. And I think about Instagram and how everyone appears to be wanting to be famous. But this study that you found, that they, you, you reported on, kind of blew my mind, said people think America, everyone wants to be famous. But actually, in reality, Americans do not care about being famous. <laughs> they think it's the North Star for everyone else, but them. That blew my mind, honestly. If, Me too. If we hadn't have done. We, we actually did that research. So we used these private opinion methods that you just can't fake. So, and we were looking at not just straight questions like "Do you want fame?" because people know you're not supposed to say yes to that, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, but you looked at trade-off priorities across 76 different attributes uh, for what success could mean in a life. And and the method, just because I'm on the right podcast here, so I can, I can, we can, sure can. Out. You can nerd out. Yeah, yeah. We brought it, it's called Conjoint and it's widely used in business. So like here, I have an iPhone, right? I, I'm not just plugging that, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't have any stock in that. And, you know, when you have to figure out what kind of combination of features and price point to put in a phone, you need to understand trade-off priorities, right? So not just what people want, but what will they sacrifice for it? So we use that method looking at public opinion, right? Like only in this case, privately, what do people, what are the trade-off priorities for a good life? And what's so interesting, like everything, um, okay, with this method, rather than just asking you point blank, it's kind of cool. What we do is say, out of those 76 items, you would get uh, a question and it would say, okay, here's person A, and it would be six randomly grabbed attributes from that list of 76, or person B with another random six, and say, which which of these two people is closer to your view of a successful life? You're like, I don't know, A. And you do it again. And you do it again and again and again. And over time, you're trading off every attribute against every other attribute. But you don't know it, right? Okay, so that's the that part of it with conjoint. So what we did was we did, we'd ask, what do you think? And then the same exact thing. What do you think most people would say? What, what would they choose? And what was fascinating in the aggregate, this idea of being famous shook out as the number one perceived 
priority for people. And it was not even close. Like it, 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 it was by far the most dominant attribute we think for other people. In private, it was dead last, number 76. Now, illusions don't get much bigger than that. And, and th- that research uh, has important implications because one of the really, really serious consequences of collective illusions is that this generation's illusions, unless you do something about them, tend to become next generation's private opinion. And here's, here's what I mean by that with respect to fame. Um, you know, some of our colleagues uh, at UCLA have been studying the effects of media on middle school kids for, for years, just kind of understanding what values are they internalizing as their own. And up until a few years ago, whenever they looked, the dominant things that they were internalizing tend to be character related. And it's kind of what you'd hope, right? I want to be a good person. I want to be honest. I want to have friends. A few years ago, it changed and it hasn't changed back. Every year now, the dominant theme is I want to be famous. I want to be a YouTube star. I, like, I remember one of the, in the qualitative interviews they did, one of the kids said, I want to have a million followers. And they said, at what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I just want to have a <laughs> it doesn't followers. matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? And, and you know, it's, it's pretty sad, right? Because it's like, it would be one thing if they were internalizing the actual values of society. But we've all learned the hard way that most of what constitutes that sort of wealth status power is, is really not a very fulfilling certainly not a self-actualized life, right? Um, and our children are now internalizing that empty view of success as their own, all because we've allowed this illusion to propagate throughout society. Yeah, this is so important. I'm so glad we're having this chat. I do want to ask you, you know, you said that it turned out it was actually, fame was actually like 71 or so. Like, what, what was number one? Like, what do people actually care about? Here's what's great. So first of all, you might not be terribly surprised given our last conversation um, that at the individual level, the trade-off priorities are unbelievably individual. Like it just, yeah. it's, there's, just, there's no yeah, average you're saying. <laughs> yeah. There's no, like when you looked at the average, like no individual actually holds that exact profile. That's but on brand what, for what you, Todd. Like, right. I, I felt pretty good about that. It was like, whew. but, but what's interesting is when you look at the, the things that cluster up top, they were things like um, relationships, uh, character, related things. Um, and then like education, but not from a, I want to go to the, the most elite school possible. It's just, I want to, they want to get, they want to get training to do things that matter to them, right? They wanted purposeful lives and they want to be good people. And let me give you one specific example. So in the aggregate, the number three most important trade-off priority for people, this was, this was just in the United States was to be viewed as trustworthy. Like, and yet, they don't think anybody else really cares about it. It's the third most important thing to them. And yet they don't think it's like, they think people would prioritize it very, very low. Now think about the the problem, right? I want to be trusted. I believe I'm trustworthy, but I don't think anybody else really cares. And I don't really think they're trustworthy. How does, how does a democracy function if we really don't think not only are people untrustworthy, but that they don't even care about it. And it's just not true. And so this is the kind of damage that illusions do to societies. I hear you. I mean, these implications are deep. You said we have found that collective illusions flourish in just about every important area of social life in America. I mean, that's that's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, once you start going down that rabbit hole, do you kind of like just see it everywhere now, Todd? Do you just like, is, <laughs> yeah, can you yeah. like not unsee what you see? <laughs> I I think I, I had to uh, course correct a little because, yeah, we, we found it so often that you just start assuming everything's an illusion, but right. not everything's an illusion. <laughs> is everything an illusion? Is that what you're saying, Tom? No, no, it's like a big matrix moment. No, we, we um, I, I think that the thing I'm, I feel safe as saying is name anything that's important in society right now, and it's a coin toss, whether it's an illusion. It's incredible. I, well, let's talk politics. This is obviously very important on a lot of people's minds. You say in California, and I was surprised why you had to write in California because this seems to apply probably everywhere. Both Democrats and Republicans assume the other side holds more extreme views than they actually do, creating a self-fulfilling misperception of political polarization. You found that that was especially prominent in California? In that case, uh, that was the best research that I had found when I was writing was oh, had gotcha. just been done in California. I didn't like some of the methods in some of the other research. I, I mm. whenever we'd like, especially when you're writing a book, as you know, it's like, yeah, you want the things that have been replicated. You want stuff with good methods, but that was rock solid. We've since actually confirmed that nationally. It's 
interesting right now. Um, in the book, I tried to stay away from politics, mainly because what I found was if you don't understand the concept of collective illusion, if your first introduction to it is something very polarizing, that issue tends to just be the, all the thing you can think about, right? So yeah. it's like you won't get your head around the actual concept. But w- what's interesting from the political standpoint is, not surprisingly, our national politics are driving a lot of these illusions. And it, it's happening on both sides. Um, but it's it's really leading to both both seeing the other side as very extreme when it's not really true. But most importantly, and even more damaging, we're seeing within any one political party the misunderstanding of our own party. Oh my gosh. I mean, I can just so clearly now see how this dovetails so nicely with your work on intelligence and that there's no such thing as averages, right? To even just having that recognition that within your in-group, there's no such thing as the average view, even in itself, right? I mean, there's this, the, the thread here is so obvious once you start unpacking this, but between your prior work and this work, right? Yeah. But it's it's interesting too, because it's like, no matter what we've looked at, so we've studied everything from, you know, again, what you mean by a successful life, uh, your our aspirations for the future of the country. Um, what? How do we want to treat one another? Uh, what do you want out of our key institutions like education and the workplace, and mm-hmm. criminal justice, these things? And it's just like, we've got so much more in common. I know it's so easy to say, right? And people try to say, <laughs> across all demographics, we share a lot in common. What, what I think collective illusions help us understand is why doesn't it feel like that? And I think this is important because, you know, there's an old, in social psychology, there's a that old Thomas theorem, right? Which is, if it's real in our imaginations, it becomes real in its consequences. So it doesn't matter that we actually share so much common ground. If we believe we are divided, then our behavior will act accordingly, right? And the consequences become self-fulfilling. So I think this is a critical time for us to understand a concept like collective illusions, because not only does it mean perhaps there's actually some common ground for us to build a, a free and, 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 and flourishing society together, but that the way we would deal with some of our problems is different. Like if we really are divided, so be it, right? There are ways to bridge honest differences and still get somewhere. But if it is a collective illusion, then what we do next is different. And sometimes leaning into an illusion as if it's private opinion can literally make the illusion stronger. Hmm. Yeah, I I would rather people have a kind of best self bias and the other person like see the best in them and be biased and be wrong than the other way or that other kind of error because you you're you're so right. It's true that when you actually lead with the bias of we're divided, you take ambiguous stimuli and you're more likely to view negativity in that. It's like why why are you angry at me? And it's like no, I actually just have a neutral face right now. <laughs> you know, like do you know you're hitting on a really important point, right? Which is, despite what most people think, most situations are pretty pretty ambiguous, yeah. right? Like, and so we, true. we are projecting a lot of assumptions in interactions. And so if I am coming into it thinking, all else equal, someone I'm just meeting probably disagrees with me on really important things. And in fact, I might not even think, their, their view might be, I, I might think is even immoral or whatever. I, I, am, I am, the way I'm engaging with them is likely to produce the very outcome that I didn't want. And so it, it matters that we get this right. And, you know, I think what's so unfortunate, and we can talk more about this, but like, it's really dangerous when, you know, two thirds of Americans admit to self-silencing right now. And, you know, I know Cato had done that research. We've, we've replicated that. It, it's, it's, it's a thing and it cuts across all demographics. It's just like, we're, we're just not being honest with each other about what we think, in part because we believe most people don't agree with us. Right? Like, and so if we can get back to just having conversations, treating one another with respect, I think we'll be shocked at the common ground that we find when we have those conversations. I completely agree. And I was wondering if you've come up with a like a, a chart like a, that just shows what people actually want and think. I mean, I feel like disseminating that information would be really valuable. You know, some kind of like white paper of like what people actually think or a cool infographic infographic. Have you thought about doing the infographic? You know, so here's what's interesting. I agree with you. And, I, and this is going to be an important step. I mean, we've published research and stuff like that. What we find and what we have found, and, and partly why I wrote the book, is the trick with illusions is your brain is certain it knows what the group thinks. So if just being told it with data that it's not true, it, the, the number of times people say, man, I, I wish it were true, but I know it's not. 
you're like, so what, oh. what we found, our strategy, we felt like is when the more that people came to understand the phenomenon of a collective illusion, the more likely it is that they were willing to take new data and say, okay, wait, now that I know that this is possible and I know that like, I can't really trust my brain to tell me what the group thinks, they were open to good data where otherwise it just seemed like the data itself, like, and if you think about it, like how many other organizations have shown us like, look how much common ground we have. And yet it doesn't seem to move the needle. So our bet is to socialize the concept of collective illusions, get people to understand this. And then hopefully we can now start to have the conversation with data about who we really are as a people. I mean, that, like to me, it's, it's, it's incumbent on us to actually meet people where they are. And, and yeah. I think this is an important concept. So it's on me to try to communicate in a way that people understand and can relate to. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, that's really sensible. Um, yeah, there's some other findings here that blew my mind. Uh, you, so why is the moment you ask someone is a woman as electable as a man? How come the moment you ask that everything changes? Yeah, this is this was one of those really remarkable. We didn't do this research, so I can brag about it. <laughs> it <doesn't, laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> uh, it's Regina Bateson. It's this really fantastic research looking at gender bias in politics, right? Mm. Because it's unbelievable. Like women are so underrepresented in in electoral politics. It's just you can't. It's but like here's the thing. Like it's important to understand what's driving that, and and for sure, let's just be clear. Just straight up sexism certainly is involved sometimes. Like that, that's certainly the case. But what what uh, Dr. Bateson found, what I think was really fascinating, is that given our winner take all, um, like sort of two party system, so much is dependent on what the gatekeepers think. Who who? Because now, like if we were doing something like ranked choice voting, it doesn't really matter. I don't have to care what I think anybody else thinks, right? But in a winner take all system, I have to do a little bit of guessing about. Who do I think most people are going to vote for, right? Because otherwise my vote is, quote unquote, wasted, right? If I take a, a flyer on that. So what was interesting is if you look at how women perform when they are nominated, in general elections, women win at the same rate as white men. Which is, so I mean, suggests obviously it's not a general election problem. And what, what she found was that it was like party leaders, especially donors, right, they're like, well, wait a minute, I'm not sexist, but I think most people in the party are, so I don't think you're going to be able to win. And so they don't get the support, they don't get the the, the resources, and it wow. becomes self-fulfilling. It's so queer when you put it that way, how that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, but there there is so much pressure within certain in groups to say this the the dominant ideology and just like don't like if you can't it's like a cult, right? Because like the second you question maybe well, you know, you're like, what does the evidence actually show? They're like, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> you're not being loyal. Um, wow. Yeah. So that, that's, it's actually um, in the book, I, I was looking at what I call these conformity traps, like these, these three kinds of situations where you are likely to slip into blind conformity and you are quite likely to do that under an illusion to begin with. And, you know, this, this sort of identity trap where you've got these groups that matter so much to who you are. Right. And, and, and especially when it's just one group, that group has cult like power over you. Right. In fact, I actually opened a chapter talking about a cult and like people's willingness to even die rather than lose that sense of belonging to the group. Mm. Um, and so that can be so powerful. And so once somebody gets control of that group, right, mm. or the, the illusion going, it can lead entire groups astray in a hurry. Oh, humans. Human, <laughs> right? Because like this, we're stuff, the worst. This, we're the well. I don't know if we're worse than turtles. They can be pretty cheeky, but the thing is about humans is that this this stuff generalize the group stuff kind of generalizes from individual relational stuff. Like it's it's a you look at codependent relationships one on one, you start to see similar dynamics. You know, like you start yeah. to. It's just, have you thought about it, the individual, like the individual uh, uh, illusion level and how those basic first principles, reasoning for first principles here, you know? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So so it's actually, there's like fractal quality to it, right? Yeah. So you see illusion in, in, in just between two people or small groups, right? Um, you know, I... I, I wrote about it in the book, but it's even with people that you know really well. Like one of, the, one of the, it was kind of funny, but like I had one with my grandmother who was like my second mom who helped raise me. And it's like, like, and it was funny. Um, the, the short version of it is, as, as we talked about previously, like my, my upbringing 
my family was great. My, you know, I, I was a hard kid to raise and uh, didn't have a lot of friends and so like that. And it was my grandmother was was always there for me. It was a place I could always go. I'd sleep over there once a month. Um, and one time, and they didn't have very much money. I mean, they really didn't have a lot of money. And um, I wanted to just be there because I, I could. I didn't have the words for it then, but like that was the place I could be myself. And like my uh, cortisol levels clearly, I'm sure dropped <laughs> like in that environment. It was like my sanctuary. And one time um, we would go and I'd, she'd make me a bologna sandwich, would play like Yahtzee and board games. Then we'd watch TV together until I fell asleep. That, and I would have done that every time. It was amazing. One time she, we decided, I don't even know how, um, they ended up taking me to this place called Sizzler, which was kind of like a cheap. I remember Sizzler. Like, yeah, I love it. I right? love Sizzler. Like yeah. steak and salad bar, right? I love it. Um, it was loud and, you know, it was fine. I actually liked but like I really just wanted to be with my grandparents right we did that like every month for years right so a a few years ago pre-pandemic uh I got went back and my grandmother was passing away and I got to be by her side and we were talking and reflecting and so I'm telling her about how how important she was to me and how important um those sleepovers were and I I just wanted to let her know because it really was going to be like the last conversation we had and she 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 interrupts me as I'm. She says, "Todd, I, 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 I know what you liked best, going to Sizzler." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, no, I, I like I, I didn't. Re- I, I just wanted to be home." So then she goes on to explain that that like, no kidding. She's like, "We didn't really want to go, um, but we know it meant a lot to you." And oh. I, meanwhile, I was I was going, and I didn't really want to go because I thought it meant a lot to them. And it Amazing. turned out this is no kidding. They didn't have enough money, so they they had given up their date nights um, to to get enough money to take me to Sizzler once a month. Oh. Right? So I, what I learned is I had crashed my grandparents' date nights, you know, for for a few years. And, and it, look, I mean, it was still great. We spent time together, but for me, it's like these kind of illusions can happen in individual relationships, even with people who know you the best. And if it can happen there, it's not terribly surprising that it happens in a country of like three hundred something million. Incredible. Todd, I just had a revelation. Do you want to hear my revelation? I do. I actually didn't really care for Sizzler either. I think <laughs> I think I felt social pressures to say, I love Sizzler you, you, when you brought it up. Right. But I From actually <laughs> Yeah. I think we just illustrated this point. <laughs> I don't think I cared much for Sizzler, to be honest. So I'm glad um, they're, they're so they're not a sponsor of your podcast is what you're saying. Not anytime soon. <laughs> that you know, like I remember the the salad bar, but did I really like the salad bar? Did I really did I really care for it? There was always like something else from a different side, a different uh, item in this in in the, you know like you, do you know what I'm saying like like. I like do. If it was pasta, <laughs> there'd be like salad r- remains from someone else's plate in the. That's right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, how did this play out in the 2020 presidential election? Yeah. So, look, I mean, if you go back all the way to 2016, we know uh, we we knew about those sort of what they called like the sort of shy Trump voters, and right or wrong, it became something that you didn't say out loud, right? Who you were going to vote for, and um, I think that the media did a good job of kind of framing if you were going to make this choice, it, it, this is what it means about you. Right. And, um, fair enough, whatever. Like, like, but so then the problem is, is like we get to vote in private. And so, you know, we, we had all, I remember where I was when that, when 2016 happened and it was like, who saw that coming? Right. And in fact, that was, that was the beginning. Um, uh, we didn't even do private opinion research, uh, before then. And, in part because of the way that turned out, we realized so much of our model for populace depends on accurately understanding what the American public cares about, what their values are, their priorities are. And we said, man, we can't take for granted anything at this point. Um, but, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I will say on the political side, one of the things that we, we found in our own data right now is the after effects of 2020, right? Well, you have one candidate who continues to say that it was stolen, right? And the way the media reports that is, that, so public opinion, if you call Republicans, just do a, a, a traditional poll. We just we just did this. 
Um, we found man, 57% will say, oh, yeah, 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 it was definitely stolen, right? Wow. Uh, that number in private is closer to 14%. Wow. Like, it, just think about it. Like, but they believe that most Republicans think it was stolen. And the reason they believe it is you've got uh, a very vocal minority, right? And, and, and of one who is saying it over and over again. And like, if, if Republicans don't really care much for the media anyway, and so if somebody, some pollster calls them from Gallup and says, do you think the election is stolen? What are you going to say? You know what you think your group thinks is the right answer, right? So it's one thing, this is important to me because it's like, like, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture here. Like, the consequence could still be real. But, but you know, especially politicians, what's interesting historically, um, I can't remember who did the research, So, I'll, but, like, they found that politicians were especially sensitive to collective illusions, even more so. Because if you think about it, all they want to do is get reelected, right? Like, that's, like, the job of a politician is to get reelected. So they are exquisitely sensitive to what they think their constituents believe, Right. And so it makes them susceptible to this. And so like, and you probably know this, like, if I don't know about you, but like the number of at the national level, the number of, of Republican elected officials who will tell me privately, of course, I know this wasn't rigged. Right. But then they'll tell you, but, but I think most of my constituents do now they're not going out and lying about it. They'll just say nothing. Right. Thinking that their silence isn't causing any harm, but in fact, it's causing great harm. This is so um, eye opening because I'm thinking about other domains now. I'm just curious, like how many Christians actually believe in an afterlife? Like if you actually privately ask them, like go down the standard beliefs of like Christianity or, or I don't mean to pick on Christianity, by the way, any, any, any religion, any religion. I'm so curious. Have you done that study? I'm curious. <laughs> Oh, but that's a, that'd be a great study because here, here's one of the tricky parts with with group belonging is that you know you think about groups whether especially like political parties whatever they aggregate a bunch of different dimensions of things right like like if so it's funny like <laughs> why do I with our two party system why do I have to be why do I have to hate gay people to believe in free markets <laughs> right like it doesn't make any sense but they they so you know groups that that pull together you know a lot of different things. Um, it's almost what we do find is it's the same kind of jagged profile thing we talked about last time, which is we know for sure there's no like average Democrat or Republican in terms of their own beliefs against the party's stated platform. Um, and so like, I would be shocked if that's not the case when it comes to religious identity. Right. But it's, yeah. it's certainly something we could do. It'd be good research. We'll, we'll work on it together, Scott. Okay. Yeah, that'd be, it's exciting. Like to know, I want to know what the truth is, you know, about what people think. Think about it. Like, if I'm like, well, I definitely, let's just pretend, let's say I, I identify as a Republican and I'm like, because I believe in free markets and free people. And I'm like, well, I, I actually don't mind people should love who they want to love. But now I feel like if I say that, I might be ostracized from the thing for which I identify, right? And so you're going to lead a lot of people to stay silent or lie about what they believe, what Tim McCurran calls preference falsification, um, just in the name of belonging. So I'm always very leery of groups that aggregate that difference, right? Like, like, why do I need a party that is, here's our 20 things that you have to swallow wholesale, or you're not a Republican, or you're not a Democrat. To me, that's always a sign that someone's trying to manipulate you. Yeah, for sure. This goes back, right? Like, didn't Seneca have an, talk about an, uh, at the existential menace of collective illusions? Yep. It's like, that's why I opened the book talking about, because I love Seneca. I love Seneca mainly because, like, He's such a, like a ball of contradictions, right? Like, yeah, that's true. Just, you know, I remember the first time I was reading him and I didn't know about him. And I'm like, I imagine this person who rejected all material life and was like living in a cave somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like some esoteric Buddhist monk before. Like, yeah, no, he was the richest person in Rome. <laughs> like, it's, but I liked it because I think, you know, he was living in a time when, when Rome became fabulously wealthy, and, you know, now people had, at, at the same time as you had these crazy emperors, right, mm -hmm. who now suddenly you couldn't say what you thought. And he was trying to give people a good advice about how to live a purposeful life in an era of abundance, mm -hmm. which was a sort of new phenomenon, mm -hmm. right, uh, at scale. Um, and so I find it just endlessly fascinating, um, his efforts. But he, he did, he was always worried 
about what, what we would now call collective illusions and the, the, the misread of the group to lead us astray individually into lives that were purposeless and quite empty. Will we ever learn? I mean, why does every generation recreate the same human nature? <laughs> I mean, I know the answer why, but right? I'm saying, what, yeah, what can right? we do to change? Can we change well, something, some generation? Yeah. I think that the, the trick is, is that, you know, we are who we are. Evolution works on a much longer time scale, right, than, than any given life. And so we need to, we rely pretty heavily on helpful social norms, right? These cultural norms that actually teach us the right way to engage with each other and that can transcend any one generation. Um, and, you know, we worked really hard um, in, in the West, you know, not, not to say, I mean, this has happened everywhere, but, it, you know, where, where we're from, um, to, to acquire norms from, from that we would have called, you know, liberal democracy, mm. right? The tolerance and respect and, and these things and individual rights. And, you know, it, you see those things start to erode now and you start to see some of that base nature taking back over the tribalism and the, the seeing the other as the enemy, um, the outgrouping of people and it. We know from history, as you said, it doesn't end well there, right? Like the erosion of these norms, not only will continue to exacerbate collective illusions, they, they, I, I think they're the biggest threat to free society that we've faced in a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. You made a very convincing case for that. I mean, I, I once I read your book, I was like, wow, Todd is so spot on there about the urgency and, uh, and, and vastness of this problem. Um, I definitely agree. Um, I have a question because um, I'm thinking, you know, I'm really interested in individual differences, but I'm also interested in like group differences. Is it like, so here's my question. Are Buddhists less likely to have collective illusions? That's my question. Did you, have you studied that? <laughs> Not Buddhists particularly, but uh, like um, I will say what we do know is that, so at an individual level, um, as, as you know, like say, say something like conformity or need to conform or need to belong. Not surprisingly, that exists on a continuum, yeah. right? It's not healthy for anything for us to be lumped into the same exact, you know, you want difference. Um, if you look at the the need to belong, there's a difference, but this need for self-expression, mm. it's also on a continuum. And so people with high need for self-expression are just less susceptible to illusion in part because the problem with illusion is not, not just that you might misread the group, it's that your behavior is affected by the misread of the group. So people with high need for self-expression are just less likely to have the read of the group affect whatever choice they make, right? And so what's interesting is not all of us are going to have super high need for self-expression. You know, most of us are probably like me. I'm more of a people pleaser than I would even want to be, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah me and, too. You know, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's probably from our last episode of conversation that you know about me now. Like, um, yeah. I've worked to, like, try not to care as much. But what's yeah. interesting is those social or cultural norms are actually what help move a lot of people from like, essentially if I want to belong, if the, if the norms of my group are be honest about what you believe, then a whole bunch of people who would otherwise do whatever else the group wants them to are now being honest about themselves and essentially protected against the biggest downsides of these illusions. And when people either because of their need for self-expression or their adherence to, to help the social norms that promote that, um, when we're all being honest and respectful about what we really think, illusions have nowhere to go, right? Like they're really hard to form in the first place. Wow. Can I can I can I bring up something off the record that's cheeky? Yeah, absolutely. I have this idea in my head of what women want and I act that way. I'm not as successful than when I tell women what I actually want, and then they're more likely to say, Oh, actually I want that too. Actually, you know what? I'll you know, keep this in. It, I'll keep this in, Todd. Think about it. Let, let's just think yeah. about this because it, it works both ways. You right? see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Let's. We we want, like, we think we have some sense for, like, what women want or men want um, from the opposite sex or or same sex. And you know, you're. Why would you be any more right about that than you are about these other things? And the thing is, is the same mechanisms that are driving illusions and other issues, like, are driving them here too. Right. And so like, we can all be saying that we want like, like as men, like let's say as heterosexual men, I'll say, Oh, there's a certain ideal about women we want. So, oh yeah. Yeah. That's what we want. And then privately we're like, not really. I, I kind of like a really strong woman. And I, I, I like, you know, these, there's a lot like personally. Right. And, yeah, yeah. um, but, but there's some feminine ideal and we might say it out loud, but to, just to your point, I mean, that, that kind of misunderstanding, think about how detrimental that is not only to individual identity, 
but to interpersonal relationships, right? Like, I think this kind of stuff holds us back from having, like, self-actualization not only for ourselves, but in the relationships that we have. I completely agree. We did, we all need to be more honest with each other and have more what you call positive deviance. I love that. I love that <laughs> phrase, um, which you define as deviation from a negative norm in a positive direction. So how can we empower people to have more positive deviance in society, despite the consequences? Because sometimes there's consequences for your group. Yeah, there are. And look, I think that there's like a, there's, it's important that when we say we've got to be honest with each other, I think sometimes people use that as an excuse to be an asshole. I agree. Look, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And like, I, I will say one of the, one of the most interesting things we found recently, we did this American Aspirations Index, looking at the trade-off priorities people want for the future of the country. And they were everything from, like, being the richest country, a strong military, like, anything our institutions could do to, to our values, how we treat one another. One of the top priorities across all demographics, it was in the top 10, no matter how you cut the data, uh, or top 15, was um, we need to treat one another with respect, despite our differences. Like, this is like an aspiration for people, right? Except for they thought it was in the bottom quarter of stuff for everybody else. So what happens if I'm like, I, I would like to get back to treating other people with respect, but I don't think they care about that for me. Back to that am ambiguous interactions that we have all the time. I'm going to read disrespect into most everything I see, right? And so I, I think it's really critical. Like, like, I talked about this as like congruence. Right, this need for our private selves and our public selves to be as as closely aligned as possible. We've known for a long time that that's that's a critical part of fulfillment and self actualization. I mean, how how do you get there? Well, you're the expert on that. Like, how do you how do you get there if you have a divided self? Like, my private self is different than my public self. Like, yeah. so we know that at an individual level. But given the the fact of collective illusions, I believe this idea of congruence may be the most important thing you can do for other people. Right. Because it doesn't help anyone when we misread each other so profoundly. Yeah, you have this. I agree. And you have the sentence with a lot of uh, like square quotes in it. You say taking authentic responsibility for our congruence in the hidden sphere of our private lives. Um, I love that. I love that. Actually, they're probably not just scare quotes. They're probably all just quotes. But you put you put those things in quotes. They were quotes because I was trying to, to ask, uh, attribute. <laughs> like, I know. Lines by other smart people that I I didn't want to. Uh, I know, and I I appreciate that, but I love those two. I love oh, I love that phrase, authentic responsibility. I love it. And again, it's like, you know, like we're, we're most people are dying to do this. Right? Like, there's just something hollow to living someone else's life, mm -hmm. right? And if I could impress anything on listeners or viewers, like a lot of reasons why we're doing this right now to ourselves is because we believe the group is against us, but. Just think, how would you behave if you knew that most people in your groups that matter to you were in agreement with you? Like, think think about what that changes about your behavior and and your your potential for happiness and flourishing. And I'm telling you, it, it's just where we are right now in this society. And like, I think social media has a lot of upside, but with respect to collective illusions, it is a funhouse of mirrors. It, it is almost a guarantee to distort. Uh, what you think the group consensus really is. So we just got to be thoughtful about the ways, not just the ways we engage on online, because that's just always going to be there, but learning about collective illusions and getting some skill and in, in not letting those distortions affect how we treat one another in real life, because that's where it really, really becomes a problem. Yeah, it sounds like a lot, a lot of what you're saying is it starts from within making societal changes. Um, you know, this idea of congruence was a big notion from one of my favorite psychologists, Carl Rogers, the humanistic psychologist. I don't know if you made that link. Yeah. I did. And I, I got a little bit of a reference to him and there was fun Beautiful. with the publisher. Cause I was like, I, I feel like Rogers doesn't get the credit. I agree. In, in the same way. I, I, I think it's like, he's one of the most uh, underexplored um, set mm -hmm. of insights, but yeah, the congruence was central to Rogers view of things. And like, when you like think about all, and Rogers then swerves right into all the areas that you're the the leading expert in, and so that's why for me I felt like uh, you would like this, which is I love it. <laughs> this congruence part of uh, our ability to get to self actualization. It, it doesn't guarantee it, but I don't know how you live a self actualized life 
if you're incongruent. I completely agree. It's it's essential. And I just love the idea of setting an example for others. You know, that's 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 the way out of this trap. <laughs> is you start doing that and then other people in your group start doing it and then all of a sudden your group's the whole illusion breaks down. The emperor has no clothes or the emperor has no clothes. Fast, the emperor does have clothes eventually. <laughs> eventually, is guess the one I'm trying to say. Eventually. Yeah. What's great about illusions is that they're powerful when they're enforced, but they're fragile because they're social lies, mm. right? Like, like you don't want it to be true. Mm. You wish it weren't true. And so what you're really looking for is, is like, wait a minute. Like, so for some of us, we just need one other person to speak up, to give us the, 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 the strength to, to do the same. Other people need more. But what you see is once you start getting the crack in the illusion, it, it affects what we call like bandwagon change, right? Like it'll just swerve quickly and suddenly it looks like almost overnight the group has shifted its view. So whenever you see stuff, um, it's funny, in politics they call it momentum. There's no such thing as momentum. That's not what that is. That is that is that is an illusion where people's private behavior is like, oh, wait a minute, this is the, like, I can now say what I really think, right? I feel comfortable saying what I really think. Um, so when you see like sort of exponential change in public opinion, like that's usually the, the that's usually that there is an illusion underneath there. Um, because if people privately believe something, it is very hard to change that. And so, you know, doing that is like one off, right? I have to change your mind, I have to change someone else's mind. And so you'll usually see slow linear growth or change in, in public opinion. When you see it change really quickly, like it did with marriage equality, marriage equality, the, the, the public approval for that, I mean, it's unreal mm -hmm. since what, since 2003 to, to today, it, it's basically flipped mm -hmm. in terms of its, its acceptance. Like that doesn't happen if privately most people were against it. It just doesn't. Such a good point. So much. So, what well, the reason why it's so hard is because, like, the oxytocin bonding mechanism is, is runs so deep in our DNA and our biology, and and overriding that is not easy. Because once we feel this social trust, we we can lie. You know, we can we'll do anything. Lie, cheat, steal for our in group. Yeah, and and that's why again, um, you know. I wrote a whole chapter on these like norms because norms are invisible and we don't realize it, but they affect so much of our behavior. And when, when norms break down, when they no longer represent our private values, they become unbelievably destructive, right? Because we think that they represent consensus and they don't, but norms at their best are supposed to hold us to our better angels, right? Like, you know, I'm sure, like, you, like I, I want to live in a fair society, but like what, okay, great. Let's have norms of fairness that in those moments when I'm tempted out of self-interest to not be fair to other people, those norms act as powerful checking mechanisms mm -hmm. on my behavior. Right. And yeah. so right now we are not being honest with each other about our values. And if that's happening, then we cannot form norms. You can't design norms. They happen out of human action, not human design. But they, they only emerge when there is a, a real consensus about our shared values. And so we've got to get back to that. I mean, it seems almost like like self-evident and well, well, duh. But like if, if we're going to continue to self-silence or even lie about our beliefs, like the result are going to be collective illusions at scale and whole societies can be taken down by those. And listen, it would be something like a free society living in a democracy. Like we take that for granted. That is a blip in human history. The idea that it can't disappear overnight is silly. It can and it will. And it would be one thing if it disappeared because privately we collectively gave up on that experiment, mm. right? But it's a tragedy mm. if it disappears, not because of private change in values, but because of collective illusions. And that's that's what, for me, felt like the urgency to write the book, right? Like that it just felt like things were spinning out of control and yet we have more data on private opinion in America than probably anybody else, I would argue. Um, and I can tell you, it's just not true. Right? <laughs> so I think that's both, there's both a, a dangerous aspect to illusions, but also a hopeful one, you know, because history has shown us that if you recognize the illusion and you take an effort to dismantle it, social change can happen at a scale and pace that would seem unimaginable otherwise. Well, I can't think of any other way to end than that message. So... Thank you, Todd, so much for this marathon you did with me in two parts. Thank you. We obviously have so much shared values, and we're not as divided as people tell us we are. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but now we know why, right? Now we know why it feels that way. And if we if we can recognize that we really can no longer trust our brain to accurately read group consensus, then we can get back to this. It never really mattered, right? Be who you are. Learn to be authentic. Um, discover your real self and, and work really hard to be congruent between your private self and your public self. The rest takes care of itself. Carl Rogers would have been very proud of this interview, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.